What's the orientation of the polarization axis? The, the polarization is, is tangential to the bow. And so it's everywhere tangential. So some photography magazines will say, oh, always use a polarizer when you're taking a picture of a rainbow. No, if you're using a wide angle lens like I did and take, take a picture of the whole rainbow, there's no polarizer in the world that can, that can be tangential to all those points. And so you can, you can polarize one part of the rainbow. And so this is a picture where I'm zoomed in looking at just one part. And so the effect works nicely. Here, the polarizer is oriented this way. And I get this nice enhanced coloration. Here, the polarizer is ori oriented orthogonal to that. And the rainbow is maybe slightly barely visible, but basically gone. So again, if you're a mean-hearted person, you can kill a rainbow but with a polarizer, or at least part of the rainbow. Or make it seem like you found the end of yeah. the you, that's right, you can put the end of the rainbow somewhere. You know, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to kind of skip this, because I gave a more complete talk on this yesterday. But, but basically, what this is showing is one of my research projects is we developed an instrument to do all sky imaging of polarization. So a clear sky, the Rayleigh scattering that we talked about earlier is dipole scattering, and that dipole scattering is polarized. So you get this pattern of polarization, which is 90 degrees from the sun. and that's what this is showing. This is on top of a mountain in Hawaii where it's very, very clean atmosphere. This is a very, very clean atmosphere also in Montana, but not as clean as up on top of that mountain. And so the degree of polarization is less. Uh, let's see. All right, so here's the reverse color order that we talked about in the rainbows. You can see that a little better. Rainbow angles, if you go through the geometry, you find out that there's a sort of a mean angle of 42 degrees for the primary rainbow in about 51 degrees for the secondary rainbow. Uh, what this means is, well, that doesn't mean that. What, what I want to do is just tell you one thing. that this, If you take these rays and continue them on, this is 51 degrees nominally, but this angle over here is a much larger angle. That's the complementary angle. That's the angle that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. That's called the scattering angle. Okay, So this is a picture just showing you that a rainbow is a circle. I, I don't have any pictures of a full rainbow circle, but this was taken as the plane was taking off from Honolulu in Hawaii. And you can see that the rainbow is extending well below the horizon. And so it, it starts at least giving you some evidence that this is a circle. And if you get in the right geometry, you can see as much of the circle as the geometry will allow you to see. OK, my last two uh, techno geek slides are these. Th these are me scattering calculation. This is for raindrops. And so this shows you that there's something over here and something over here. But this is scattered irradiance as a function of scattering angle. So the scattering angle is the angle between where the light was going and where it ends up going after it's scattered. Okay, so it's this angle. What we see is that out here at about 140 degrees scattering angle, there's, there's a bunch of light with some oscillations. This is called the primary rainbow. That's what we just looked at. Does that make sense? Well, we, we were saying that it was at about 40 so degrees. 180 minus 40 puts you at, at 140. And so the scattering angle of 140 corresponds to what we just saw. The secondary rainbow is right here. And in between there is what we call the Alexander's dark band. There's a dark band from literally the angular range from which we stole light to create the rainbow. <coughs> There's also oscillations around there, which are interference effects that the geometric optics doesn't predict. Um, but here's a picture. And in this lighting, it's not showing up really well. But you can see the rainbow with some extra stripes down here. Sometimes you'll see those really distinctly. And those extra bands are interference bands that are coming about that were predicted on that plot that I just showed you. OK, if we, go, if we do this instead of a raindrop for small cloud droplets, you get a very similar pattern. You get a, a bow. And I'll call it a cloud bow because it's not a rainbow. It's not rain. It's, the cloud bow is much broader and much, much smoother. And if I had the wavelength dependence shown here, you would see that the, the colors get washed out because of overlapping orders. But what you do see is that this thing and this thing become much more interesting now, much broader, much more noticeable. This effect, at, which is near zero scattering angle, is called the corona. That's what we talked about. Remember the 
picture of the rings around the sun or the moon. So if you look right at the optical source, you get rings around the source, that's the corona. If you look at the opposite direction, toward the antisolar direction, if you get some colored rings around that point, that's called the glory. And I have a picture of a cloud bow and a glory here. This is a cloud bow. You can just see that white band. So usually there's not much coloration visible in a cloud bow because the, the particles are so small that you're getting interference and those, uh, those orders are, the, the colors are overlapping. You, you have the same problem with your drop size distribution not being quite right to get colors. So we get a white rainbow. It's the same size, essentially, as a, as a rainbow, but it's white. Down here at the center, that's the, that's the anti-solar point. You can probably just barely make out a little colored ring there. That's called the glory. That's that point that I showed you was predicted by the calculations. OK, that's just showing us where the geometry is. I'm kind of proud of this picture. I took it just three nights ago. I was down at Yellowstone Park, and I took a picture late at night. And here's a cloud bow in the steam coming off of this uh, hot pot. So isn't that kind of neat that it's just, uh, it's the kind of thing where you're walking around and all of a sudden it catches your eye. And I was like, hey, wait a minute, there's something there. I think it's a cloud bow. So I took the picture and sure enough, there it was. Okay, one of the last segments that I'll talk about here is, is just I want to return to this idea of the glory. And again, we have a little bit too much light to make it out really nicely, but there's, there's a small patch of color right around here. This is a picture where I'm taking off in an airplane. I spend a lot of time on airplanes, if you can't tell. <laughs> I, we're taking off from the Bozeman Airport in Bozeman, Montana, in the middle of winter, as you can tell. That's where my ski resort is back there. That's where I go skiing 20 minutes from my door. Just, I'll brag a little bit. <laughs> so this is the Bridger Mountain Range. This is what's called the Crazy Mountains. And these are the, uh, these are the Absorca Mountains. And Yellowstone Park would be over here a little ways. And so we're taking off, and the mountains are sticking up through the clouds. It's an unusual day where we just have this low cloud bank, and you can see a glory there. And I'll, t I'll show you a sequence of pictures, not of the same glory, just of different ones, that show you getting closer and closer to, s to see what you can see. So a lot of you will be flying, maybe, when you go home. Watch for this. If you're on the side of the plane away from the sun, try to find the shadow of the airplane and watch for it as you take off through the clouds. And and you'll be able to see this. Here you can see the nice colored rings. Here's the shadow of the airplane. You can just barely make out that that's an airplane shadow. When you get closer, now it's much more obvious that it's a, that it's a shadow of an airplane. And the center of the glory is always at the camera point. So you can tell exactly where the photographer was sitting. So I was sitting behind the wing. I, I, I resist strongly any any tendency for the airlines to put me in seats over the wing because I like to take photographs and <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I like to be able to see. So I'm either behind the wing or in this case I got upgraded and I'm forward of the wing. <laughs> so um, this is a really dramatic photo and I'm actually in the cloud. We're flying in the middle of the cloud and, and as we're flying the cloud is changing very rapidly because it's, it's non-uniform spatially. And I had to enhance the photo a little bit because it was really dark. But you can see that it looks like there's multiple wings. And that's just an artifact of the fact that during the exposure time, the clouds were oscillating from close to me and further away from me. And spatially, there's non-uniformities. And you can see the glory is, is right here, centered right on my point where I'm sitting. And so you can tell that the, the glory is a diffraction phenomenon or, or a scattering phenomenon. So it stays the same size angularly. But the shadow is a geometric effect, and so the closer you are to the, to the screen, so to speak, the larger the shadow. And if we do this with ice crystals, we can get various ray paths. I would love to spend another two hours talking about ice crystal optics, but I won't. But I, I would like to leave you with a quick comment that if you bring sunlight into an ice crystal like this, the, min the minimum deviation ray tracing problem shows you that you'll get a 22 degree deviation. And if the crystals are little hexagonal plates that tend to grow in nature, you get these two spots that you've probably all seen. These are called sun dogs. They're 22 degrees away from the sun. 
it, here's a little measure. If you put your hand out and extend your thumb and your pinky, put your thumb on the sun or the moon, the light source, and close one eye so that you can block the sun with that, your pinky outstretched is approximately 22 degrees with your arm outstretched. Doesn't matter what shape body you have, it's pretty much 22 degrees. And so if you do that, you can tell pretty much if you're looking at a 22 degree halo or not. And a rainbow will be twice that size in angular space. So there's, there's the sun dog or parhelion. If you randomize the orientation of those plates, you can take that same pattern and spin it around in a circle and create a halo. This is a picture of a halo that I photographed in Tucson actually a number of years ago. And it's uh, centered around a palm tree, which is kind of cute. All right, the very last thing I want to talk about is something you probably will never see in Tucson, but, but I want to encourage you to come look for it, either by coming to Montana or going where I spent some years growing up, which is in Alaska. If you look at charged particles that are coming in from the sun, when there's solar activity, like a sunspot, for example, that forms what we call, kind of euphemistically, the solar wind. Okay, there's not really wind in space, but it's a, it's a stream of particles that come in through space and are captured by the geomagnetic field of Earth. And that magnetic field then captures the particles and brings them in. And guess where they intersect with the atmosphere? Up in these polar regions, South Pole and North Pole. And so if you are at high latitudes around the polar regions, you can see this kind of effect. This is not in the polar regions, this is in Bozeman where I live, which is about as mid-latitude as you can get. It's right at about 45 degrees mid-latitude, so halfway between the equator and the North Pole. But we're far enough north that we do get auroras a number of times per year on a good year. And this is a photograph that I took of a wave cloud, by the way, over the mountains, ski resorts back over here. And the uh, green emission from oxygen atoms being collided by, they, they're being struck by energetic particles coming in from the sun, and that collision releases energy in the form of light. And the color of the light tells you the energy of the transition. This is oxygen emission. It's 557.7 nanometers. The red light is also oxygen up above, but a slightly different transition. This picture of a different aurora tells you that there definitely is some more red. You can see the red a little bit more. If you want to talk about how often you can see auroras, it depends on a couple parameters. One is your location with respect to the pole. And so I grew up actually mostly in Fairbanks, Alaska right here. That's about the best place, that's the best latitude at least to observe auroras. And so it's a great place. If you want to see auroras, wait a few years for the solar maximum to happen and go to a place like Fairbanks. I live at about this latitude, which says that all else being equal, maybe 10 nights per year, I can see aurora. Down here in Tucson, we get less than one night per year, and that would be a pretty fortunate circumstance. <laughs> this is all driven by sunspot activity on the sun, which tends to follow an 11-year cycle. And you can see that the last peak was at about 2001, 2002. So we should be approaching solar maximum right now, but we're not. The, last, the current solar minimum has been the longest, quietest solar minimum on, in modern times. Nobody completely understands why. But um, someday it's going to start going up. It's actually going up slowly right now, but, but one of these days we hope to get some sunspot activity. And so we created a, a sensor at my lab, and now we've been funded by what's called the Montana Space Grant Consortium to build a network of these across Montana. And we're actually using these sensors to tell when there's an aurora, and then it sends cell phone text messages to tell you when there's an opportunity to see one. So that's kind of cool. I took some students to Alaska to test these things, and so we spent Christmas break one year in Alaska and spring break the other year in Alaska. Uh, the great things you get to do as a student, right? And so my final picture will be this, which is one of the more dramatic auroras I've ever seen in Montana, at least and tell you that I hope you always enjoy looking around you and seeing the optics that is outside of your lab and understanding a little bit about that and appreciating what Mother Nature does for us. She's as, as good an optical scientist as any of us will ever be. So thank you for your attention.